Here's the title, Impacts of Kernza on Water Uptake and Nitrogen Leaching in the Minnesota Wellhead Protection Areas. This is the name of the grant that Forever Green awarded to us through um, the generous support by the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act. And the collaborators include uh, Jess Gutnick and uh, Jake Jungers uh, from Department of Soil, Water and Climate and Department of Agronomy and Plant Genetics. And we have a couple of other people working on the project as well who are on the uh, video today, including a, a graduate student in water resources science, Garna Correll, and then a uh, postdoc, uh, Mohammed Tahir. Okay, so with that. Hi, Dave. Can I ask a quick question? Sorry to interrupt. Uh, what yes, did you, um, would you like us to, to be this organic, like we can interrupt you, or you, you'd rather like finish the presentation? What, what's your preference? I know it's going to oh. be disrupting, so. That's what yeah, asking. I don't. I don't mind if you uh, have questions. It's a bit difficult when I'm on full screen okay. to see anything in chat, or mm -hmm. but um, just uh, you know, use your voice. That'll be the best way. Okay. Thanks, Dave. Let's try to hold them if we can, right? Unless okay. there's something. Unless he says, says something really crazy, right? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Sounds good. Yeah, and, and I can, David, this is, or everyone, this is Jess. I can, I will keep the, an eye on the chat for you also, David. Thank you. Perfect. All right. So uh, first of all, I think I wanna give a rationale for the study. We do have problems with uh, nitrate contamination of our groundwater in Minnesota. And uh, there are several um, drinking water source management areas that are shown on the map here. Um, and um, about five to 10% of our private wells have uh, nitrate concentrations that exceed our drinking water standard. And so the idea that kind of has come to the forefront is um, we could solve a lot of these problems by planting perennial crops in wellhead protection areas, but we need additional research to find out, um, you know, what the effectiveness is and um, how many acres we really need to plant and where. And we also have problems with our surface waters. Uh, and I've been involved for a number of years with uh, efforts by state government to develop strategies for reducing nitrogen and phosphorus contamination of our surface waters. And this uh, was embodied in the nutrient reduction strategy um, that has been adopted in the state since about 2013. So we have nutrient losses uh, uh, from fertilizer and manure application rates on corn and mineralization of our soil organic matter. We have precipitation patterns that cause a lot of uh, leaching in the uh, months of April, May, and June. And uh, we have long-term goals now, reduce the nitrate loads by 45%, uh, and in shorter term goals of 20% reduction. And you can see uh, much of Southern Minnesota is in the area that has quite high losses of nitrogen to our surface waters. Um, as part of the nutrient reduction strategy that I helped work on. Um, we did a lot of detailed study on the BMPs that could be used to help us reach the interim and the long-term goals. And we looked at both the reductions that would be achieved with those BMPs and the costs for adopting them. And so you can see we have three major strategies for reducing N. Uh, strategies that deal with nitrogen fertilizer rate and timing, uh, BMPs that depend on structural uh, BMPs like tile drainage and bioreactors as well as fertilizer management, and then the combination of those two strategies with vegetative BMPs like cover crops and perennial crops. And in the past, a lot of the vegetative practices would uh, not have had an economic value 
and they would have taken land out of production that uh, would have had, you know, economic value if other crops had been produced. So in the past, th these vegetative practices have been limited in their adoption, but now we're seeing economic markets develop like the markets for intermediate wheatgrass or Kernza. And so um, these costs that we were uh, estimating when we started the nutrient reduction strategy are coming down. But uh, nevertheless, uh, to get the type of reductions that we need in the state, which are, you know, 25 to 40 percent, it's going to take a lot of effort to target these PMPs to the right landscapes and um, in the right amounts. <clears throat> I have another project that's funded by uh, the Board of Water and Soil Resources through the Clean Water Land and Legacy Act. And we've been trying to assess how many acres of cover crops are being grown in the state of Minnesota using remote sensing. And uh, for fall of 2019, here are the results we obtained. Uh, we estimated that there are about 300,000 acres of cover crops that emerged in the state of Minnesota during the fall of 2019. And so obviously this is one type of, you know, vegetative practice that has been promoted widely, but um, the level of adoption is relatively small. It's uh, in, in large part still less than 1% on most of the major crop producing areas of Minnesota. So uh, we turn then to perennial crop strategies for reducing N, and these generally have uh, negligible end loadings uh, below the rooting zone because of their deep roots. As you can see in this uh, famous photo that was obtained through the Land Institute, uh, they, re they can replace annual crops if there's a market, <clears throat> and uh, markets for kerns are emerging. And uh, the annual crops they replace would have high rates of end fertilizer, uh, leading to larger end losses uh, through below the rooting zone. So um, the crop we're working on uh, in our project is Kernza or intermediate wheatgrass. It's a cool season perennial grass uh, serving as the world's first commercially viable perennial green crop. And uh, it has the potential to reduce nitrate leaching to groundwater and protecting rural water supplies from nitrate contamination. And there's been a lot of uh, press about this crop. Uh, you can see here a, a Star Tribune article <clears throat> that featured uh, uh, Jake Jung Youngers, who is uh, leading a lot of these efforts to study Kernza. And um, another set of articles in the Pioneer Press that featured Don Wise. Um, so the rationale for this research is that we, we know little about water uptake by Kernza and how the uptake varies with growth. Um, the water uptake obviously is part of the story behind how nitrate uh, gets into the uh, groundwater and the area below the rooting zone because nitrate is an anion that can leach with water. And so we need to understand both the nitrogen and the water dynamics in order to estimate nitrate leaching. And of course, nitrogen um, cycling is also coupled with carbon cycling. And so there's a, a, a coupling between the water, nitrogen, and carbon cycles in the soils and these dynamics really control not only the uh, ecosystem services that are provided by Kernza, but also the uh, grain yield. So the objectives, we have really four major objectives for the project that was funded and has really just started this year. Uh, and that is to measure water, carbon, and nitrogen dynamics and uh, crop biomass and yield in Kernza production fields managed with and without nitrogen fertilizer. And these production fields are in southwestern Minnesota in the Lincoln um, Pipestone County region, where there is a significant amount of concern over um, nitrate 
movement to the drinking water source protection areas. I will secondly use these uh, plant growth water and carbon nitrogen dynamics to simulate the impacts of Kernza on the hydrology and water quality. And um, we'll collect plant growth data from the production fields and use satellite based estimates of crop biomass and evapotranspiration to predict kerns of growth and yield. And then uh, we'll take all of these data with uh, a model that we're using called the, the decision support agricultural technology model to forecast crop biomass and the impacts of kerns on the hydrology and the water quality in our test fields and then scale those results up to the entire um, sort of wellhead protection area that we're working in. Um, maybe I'll, I'll just stop for a sec uh, before going on and, and ask if there's any questions. Yes, good. Quick question, uh, uh, David, um, about the, um, so, so is there a specific reason you decided on DSAT and, and versus uh, other crop models? The reason why- Well, we've, yeah, yeah, we've been working yeah. with uh, DSAT for a number of years on other projects. And um, one of the things that is needed with Kearns is to kind of develop new um, crop, crop simulation modules and DSAT's very flexible in allowing you to adapt things like, you know, existing databases for wheat to, to get um, accurate um, genealogic traits into the modeling effort. So, so we, we, and it's a well-supported model um, that a lot of users can, can um, basically take up and use after our effort ends. Um, okay. it's not, uh, it's not an ex extremely difficult model to use. It has a good user interface. Um, and it's again, well supported. So yeah, there are other models out there. There's AppSim and there's more phenologically based models, but this is a good blend of, um, effort relating to the cropping system the hydrology and the nitrogen carbon cycling. Yeah, the, the reason why I'm asking, obviously you know about these other models is that they are different in terms of what they have under the hood. And even for well characterized crops for as like wheat or, or the, 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 way, the relative weights to photosynthesis based processes or to uh, you know, water relation based processes or, you know, uh, radiation use efficiency, those are, like they are different, like they made differently. And I'm curious as to what extent a different model with a different philosophy as to how to capture perenniality and how to capture those kind of, uh, um, you know, carbon water processes uh, for a perennial crop would generate different outcomes. Yeah, I mean, uh, um, I know you're very, um, you know, well versed in a lot of these topics. So if you have suggestions, I would really welcome those. And, uh, you know, I think this, this would be an area for fruitful collaboration. Sure, yeah. It's just like an ongoing debate right now about like, you know, intermodal comparisons and, right. and how to make sure that, you know, in terms of decision-making, you have a, an error bar on outcomes. That, that comes from different views, which are captured by different models. But right. you have to start somewhere, so I totally- yeah. And I mean, our approach is gonna to be to calibrate and validate the model based on, you know, actual experimental data. So I think um, in, in, in terms of that approach, we have, we'll, we'll have good confidence in our results. But there are certainly some questions that our model won't, won't be able to answer that another model might. Yeah. And that's where the value of uh, bringing in other models is. Yeah, I agree. David, one, I have one question. This is Don. <clears throat> so, so these are uh, the areas that we're working in are, are recharge areas, right? And now you're putting yeah. the perennial grass on this landscape. And within your studies, are you going to be able to determine whether or not 
the water infra infiltration uh, rate is going to be enough to maintain the water supply uh, for those wells? Will that be part of, um, of the modeling work? Yeah, we will definitely be estimating, you know, percolation of water below the rooting zone and we can estimate travel times yeah. of the nitrate to the groundwater. And so we'll have a lot of information that will be used to assess um, not only the, um, the cropping system and its impact, but also the impact on the deeper groundwater. Yeah, in terms of use rate versus infiltration rates, yeah. Okay, yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Dave, I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, uh, you mentioned the contamination from the nitrate. Uh, is there any relationship between the increase of contamination of nitrate with the decrease of acreage of other crop like alfalfa, soybean, or maybe not soybean, soybean increase the acreage, decrease uh, for alfalfa, those uh, uh, nitrate fixation plants or crops. Is there any study to show that relationship? Yes, I mean, we've been doing modeling of these systems for a number of years with support from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and the um, uh, Clean Water Land and Legacy Act. And so we have uh, extensive comparisons of nitrogen leaching and the hydrology in corn, 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 soybean, soybean, corn, corn, soybean, alfalfa, and alfalfa corn crop rotations. We've also looked at the impacts of cover crops so what we're doing with this particular project is adding to that body of work with a different crop, uh, intermediate wheatgrass. Okay. Is, I'll uh, show, wait, I'll show. Go ahead. Uh, will the alfalfa help to reduce the contamination? That, that is my uh, assumption, but not, not sure is true. Oh, yes. Yeah. So we have good experimental and modeling evidence that if you replace, um, say, a continuous corn rotation with corn alfalfa, the nitrate leaching losses go way down. And, um, you, you know, that's the benefit of adding more perenniality. So alfalfa is a good example of one type of perennial crop. Kernza is another. Uh, obviously, in this study, we are going to be focusing more on Kernza in alfalfa, but we'll be making comparisons to other crops and cropping okay. systems. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. All right, so I want to give some background on uh, the study location. Lincoln Pipe Stone County has a number of drinking water source management areas and wellhead protection areas. And um, our previous modeling efforts have um, indicated that there's about 146,000 hectares of cropland uh, that's divided into four crop rotations, continuous corn, corn soybean or soybean corn, alfalfa corn, and then alfalfa corn soybean. And 87% um, of the, the counties uh, have um, the corn soybean rotation, 8% is in the corn corn rotation, 4% is in the alfalfa corn, and then the remainder is in the alfalfa corn soybean rotation. And then if you look at groundwater loading, uh, again, it's really closely tied to the distribution of the acreage. So again, about 87% of the groundwater loading, uh, which is a total of about 5,000 um, mega, megagrams of nitrogen, 87% uh, of that is from the, the uh, corn soybean rotation and 9% is from the corn corn so, uh, rotation. So shifting part of these existing crop rotations into intermediate wheatgrass, we would expect would help reduce the nitrogen loadings. And uh, one of the objectives of our study is to find out by how much and to evaluate um, how many acres or hectares of intermediate wheatgrass plantings are really needed to make a dent 
in the uh, nitrate lo loadings to groundwater. So getting to the field locations, we have two field locations identified for this study. One is near Edgerton and the other is near Luverne. And you can see the map showing Luverne and Edgerton. Uh, we have um, replicated trials that involve um, four um, kerns of plantings with no nitrogen and then four additional that have 60 kilograms of nitrogen. And that experimental design is, re is replicated at the Edgerton site. So we'll be, um, you know, studying these two different locations, which are both in wellhead protection areas. And the soil and crop measurements we're taking will be uh, nitrate samples using suction lysimeters at 50 centimeters, soil moisture measurements using sensors at 15 and 50 centimeters. Uh, we've already done soil sampling and uh, the samples are being analyzed for soil texture and different nutrients. Um, we're doing, we're going to analyze the soils for carbon and nitrogen. Uh, and then we'll be measuring crop biomass during the growing season and measuring yield at harvest. Uh, we'll also <clears throat> use satellite imagery at these two locations to uh, estimate crop biomass using normalized difference vegetative index. And we'll be using the metric approach, which is an energy balance that can be used to measure the evapotranspiration of the crop. And all these data then will be uh, moved into our modeling efforts using DSAT. And uh, we'll be using that set of data to calibrate and validate DSAT and then use it to forecast uh, biomass and yield of Kernza, as well as the impacts on hydrology, water quality, and carbon cycling. Um, and then we'll use long-term climatic data sets with the validated model to upscale and regionalize our results so that we can estimate what the impacts of Kernza plantings might be on uh, the groundwater. Uh, for different assumptions about how much land is planted. And so um, that's kind of described here on this slide. We'll, we'll take our baseline simulations uh, for the existing crop rotations, in, interject uh, intermediate wheatgrass plantings with different assumptions about the acres planted and the locations planted, and then um, these estimates can be used uh, by policymakers to uh, make decisions about, you know, how to roll out kerns of plantings, where and how much should be planted uh, to get the greatest benefits for water quality. So um, we have some experience modeling um, kerns. We've had a project uh, that was led uh, by the Forever Green Initiative starting in 2013, um, or maybe a bit earlier than that, actually maybe started in 2011. And um, there were three locations in the state, one in Crookston, one in Lamberton, and one in Wasika, where uh, Kernza was compared with switchgrass and corn soybeans. Um, soil water content was measured at uh, 50 and 100 centimeter depth. And as you can see from these results from that previous study, um, the soil moisture is much lower in the intermediate wheatgrass at the 50 centimeter depth because the Kernza takes up more water from the soil profile than the, um, the corn and soybean or the, the switchgrass. And so it has higher evapotranspiration uh, because of the deeper rooting systems. Um, you don't see as much of a difference at a meter deep. Um, obviously, um, there are still differences, but those differences are smaller than they are near the surface where a greater percentage of the rooting mass is located. Um, some other previous results that we had uh, concerned uh, nitrogen leaching 
And as you can see here, average of results uh, over all years at Crookston, Lamberton, and Wasika. Um, the average nitrate leaching for the corn soybean rotation was over 20 kilograms per hectare. And the, the switchgrass was um, only about three to four kilograms per hectare. And the kerns I had really, really negligible amounts of nitrate leaching. So with switchgrass and Kernza, the nitrogen leaching losses were reduced by over 83%. <clears throat> uh, results of these studies have been published um, in Agriculture Ecosystems and Environment. Uh, you can go to that paper if you wanna read more about our results. Now, we've had some other research on cover crops and um, our previous research shows that if you plant um, cover crops into different types of crop rotations, you get generally uh, speaking a 20 to a 30% reduction in nitrogen losses relative to the baseline in the corn, 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 soybean or soybean corn rotations. Uh, we have some preliminary information that shows that if rye is planted after soybeans, you tend to get higher biomass than if rye is planted after corn. And, um, but, but generally speaking, the reductions uh, in planting rye are in the ballpark of 20 to 30%. So those are good, but they're smaller than the reductions you get if you plant um, switchgrass or kernza. So uh, to conclude here, our previous research suggests that Kernza can increase water uptake and decrease nitrate leaching in um, uh, rotations that involve annual crops. And the present project is going to look more in detail at the water uptake carbon cycling in nitrate and leaching in Kernza production fields located in the Lincoln Pipestone region where you have a lot of wellhead protection areas. If successful, our results will stimulate the expansion of currents of plantings to protect Minnesota's groundwater resources from nitrate pollution. Uh, so that's kind of the, the overall scope of our project. And I guess I'd like to give an opportunity to either uh, Jake Youngers or Jess Gutnick to add a few final thoughts. Um, since they're also part of the team. I'd be happy just to help address any questions at first. I see Matt Ott sent one in the chat um, and maybe I can- All right, we'll, we'll deal with, okay, we'll deal with questions in just a second. Jess, did you have any suggest any things to add? Uh, no, I don't. <laughs> I was gonna offer the same thing. I, yeah, All right. I you, yeah, I think you did a really nice, job covering the work and yeah if anyone has questions about you know how we're thinking about this the soil underlying these you know nitrate patterns i'm ha i'm happy to answer those questions all right great Thanks, thank Steven. you very much i'm going to go to um a little bit not a full screen sort of show so that i can see things a bit better and um so uh any questions? I guess Matthew Ott has a question. Is a 50 centimeter lysimeter depth deep enough to estimate the amount of N that could be lost to groundwater? Uh, could some of the N at 50 centimeters be recaptured by even an annual crop? And uh, yes, that's a good observation. Uh, it's more likely that it would be captured by the perennial crops but the objective here is to collect some data for the modeling effort that we can use to calibrate and validate the model. And then with the model, we can estimate the nitrate leaching losses at different depths. So um, it's really a function of, we don't have a big enough budget to put lysimeters at two depths. Um, obviously that would be a better approach, but our budget is limited. 
maybe just to follow up on that too, this is Jake. We have um, other studies going on across the state with lysimeters. And in many of those, we have lysimeters at two depths, 50 and 100 centimeters. And it's, um, we rarely get enough sample from the 100 centimeter depth. Uh, we're just not seeing much enough moisture down there to um, consistently get data. And in those situations too, we're relying a little bit more on the nitrate data or the, the nitrate analyses from those lysimeter samples. Whereas exactly what David said here, they're used more for calibration and validation of the model. So we figured we'd go at the 50 centimeter depth because we can consistently collect data from those. <clears throat> Well, that kind of gets at the point I was raising earlier, you know, in terms of the recharge uh, for those 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 wells, and it goes back to a, a joke that I had in some of our research projects with cover crops. It had to do with the fact that we put these cover crops out there; they were just perfect in managing weeds, but we didn't get any vegetables. <laughs> uh <-huh>. So, <laughs> uh, you know, in my quirky way of thinking is, okay, yeah, there's no nitrogen uh, in those wells, but we don't have any water in those wells either, right? So uh, I guess what I was going to ask those of you that know things about wellhead recharge areas, is it uniform across them or are there specific areas within a, in a recharge area that, that um, that the water tends to move through, or is it kind of a uniform model of water movement in a recharge area? I just don't know enough about it. Right. right. So, so the wellhead protection area is is a recharge area. That's an area that needs to be protected. But more broadly, there are um, because that's a drinking water source. But there are more broadly other areas of the aquifer that can be recharged, and um, their rate of recharge depends primarily on the precipitation and the uh, soil type, in, in, you know, because the, the cropping systems are relatively uniform. Um, so the differences that we see are mainly due to soil type and precipitation. And in uh, the Lincoln Pipestone area, we've done a lot of modeling already on deep percolation and um, we, we see that in a dry year, like uh, 2013, we might have um, 75 millimeters of percolation below the rooting zone. Whereas in a wet year, uh, like 2018, we might have a percolation rate of about 250. So the amount varies tremendously from year to year. I see, yeah. And it also varies somewhat by cropping system and by soil type. Yeah. So this is Jeff Berg. I was just going to add, and I think in the chat, if I can find it, I'll put it. So all these DWISMAs, drinking water supply management areas, are a sign of vulnerability based on soils and geology. So, you know, within a DWISMA, and Lincoln Pipestone is a huge one, there'll be variability based on soils and hydrology. And, infiltration. So I'll try to send you that link that uh, is out there. Yeah, thank you. And we're getting questions in chat also. Does percolation vary by time of year? Yes, obviously, uh, because of the different distribution of rainfall and the evapotranspiration by the crop. So <clears throat> when the crop is small and you have heavy rainfall, there's more percolation. And when you have the same rainfall but uh, mature crop that's uh, transpiring, <clears throat> then uh, the soil is able to take up and store a lot of the rainfall before it can uh, percolate below the rooting zone. And so your percolation is less. Isn't also only a portion of Dwismas are an agricultural row crop land. So it stands to reason that the majority of nitrate leaching may be coming on a minority of the land in that area, um, Don, that just addressing your yeah, that's infiltration kind of and recharge like, question. I hadn't really thought about that, that those level of details, right? So mm -hmm. in this Duisma, is, is there a stream that goes through? 
There's no stream in, in the stream. Is there a stream that goes through? Like a, a, a little creek? Yeah. Um, not generally speaking. I see. No, no, you... Maybe there would be these veins where you would have the movement of water through uh, through the profile. Yeah. So, Don, are you? This is Randy Ellingbo. Are you speaking in uh, specifically about the study areas for Lincoln Pipestone, or are you talking more? I, I was thinking specifically there as we're talking about that, and whether or not there are specific areas where you would have more recharge than others within uh, within a duisma. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> I'll speak more generically to that based on my understanding anyway, is that, yeah, uh, as already mentioned, um, based on the, the soil types, not only at the at or near the surface, but then the underlying soils and underlying geology, um, the, it's uh, probably uh, more common to have uh, variability in the, in the uh, groundwater flow patterns than a uniform flow pattern across the duisma. And so that's part of what the hydrologists um, at the Department of Health and at the Department of Agriculture um, do try to um, develop a, a picture of it. But of course, it can be uh, challenging to get a really accurate picture of the underlying deeper soil conditions and geology, which can have quite an impact on ground. Yeah. Thanks, Randy. Glad you're online today, Randy. <laughs> it's always interesting. Thank you for allowing us to uh, participate. <laughs> we can't let you fade away too fast. <laughs> I, I certainly hope not. <laughs> I'm not ready to fade away, I guess. <laughs> All right, another question about field topography. Um, the Edgerton field does have some standing water areas. Does this impact things? Yes, obviously, <clears throat> you know, if you have areas where uh, there's concentrated flow of water and ponding, uh, you could get higher recharge there, and we will we will collect topographic information uh, from lidar, and then analyze the topography using uh, terrain attributes to calculate stream uh, power index and uh, compound topographic wetness, and those two factors will help us know where water is flowing in the field and also where it's ponding and uh, so we can take those kinds of things into account. And Carmen, the point that you're making is that that, that would be where the water would uh, come, would, uh, would settle, but it also would be the area where you would have probably in many cases with, with Kernza, the, the, the most uh, or the least plant development because it's kind of susceptible to, to standing water, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, because we have a field that we planted in 2019 and it stood water uh, uh, this spring too long and uh, there's a little spot there that the Kernza is gone virtually. Yeah. See, yeah, Carmen, we'll I know be, some agronomy too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we'll be measuring, you know, the variability in yields and crop development using a variety of techniques and linking everything together with topography and soils. One other issue that I'd like to bring up today and uh, it came up and I don't remember who asked the question about alfalfa, but you know, that's one thing that we think in detail about in the context of the forever green. It's not just the specific crops, but how they're put into, uh, into, into, into cropping systems. And one system that I always thought about, and I think uh, Jake and others are probably thinking about this, and maybe even have these systems in place already, but the combination of three years of alfalfa and three years of, of, of Kernza with no additional nitrogen going into the system other than what is fixed by the alfalfa. And 
all you guys know more about this than I do, but you know, a three year stand or two year stand of alfalfa providing enough nitrogen for at least two and a half years of corn, kind of in general. Uh, so, so I think that is something that really ought to be looked at out there in one of these duismas as a, as a cropping system, you know, the alfalfa uh, kerns a, uh, uh, system and developing the markets for the alfalfa, the alfalfa protein and the seed from uh, uh, and uh, fodder from uh, from 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 the from the Kernza. So d is the is the alfalfa breeder U.S. new alfalfa breeder online today? He was. I saw Josh online a few, well, when we started, but I don't know if he's still on. I'm here, but I'm not the breeder, David. Um, Dan, you was on. He asked the question about the alfalfa earlier. I'm not sure if he's still here. Looks like he might not be, yeah. but he was on. Yeah, so, so for those of you who don't know, uh, you know, the, the uh, St. Paul campus, you know, was a lead program with the USDA and state scientists and alfalfa development and the development of alfalfa systems. And that whole program has been rebuilt uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, breeding all the way through uh, genomics through uh, end use. So um, again, we just want to remind everyone that we have that capacity and that cropping system of Alfalfa and Kerns, I think, is something that really ought to be take. We really ought to uh, to take a real good look at. Well, I think Jake is probably going to be addressing this in the big uh, grant that we've got. But I'm wondering if uh, three years of alfalfa would impact the P and K levels needed for the Kerns, if you're going to be taking the alfalfa off. Yeah, there you go, Carmen, kicking holes in an idea. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> if, if we don't have anyone to kick holes in our idea, how are we, how are we ever going to know that we have decent ideas? <laughs> <laughs> there you go, supporting Carmen. <laughs> uh, I, I'm hoping we'll talk about that, you know, on into the future with this uh, fertility piece of that grant. Yeah. So, so Jake, is that part of the uh, of the work that's going to be under the grant? Yeah, it is. It's also right. part of our other um, Forever Green grant too, the agronomy one. Yeah. Um, it's a P and K study. So, yeah, it's pretty important questions there. With, in there's Kearns has all this opportunity to associate with mycorrhizal fungi being a perennial, and uh, we need to kind of measure the benefit of that. What really is the phosphorus benefits of that association because we're not tilling the soil and then how does putting some nitrogen on influence that relationship so that's uh, being studied in the forever green grant but then at a much larger scale um, in the new SASCAP grant. Yeah there's actually a related question in the chat as well that is also being addressed or is under consideration is fall and fertilizer being studied. Is it needed agronomically and are there nitrate removal concern, movement concerns? So yeah, the, the idea of when to apply nitrogen, should you apply it in a you know, split between two times during the year are, are also questions that are kind of being addressed by the fertility part of this new grant and we're hoping we're hopeful that we can try to look at how those different timings impact you know nitrate movement through the system so Jake, just, don't we have some of that data already yeah we have we've done a nitrogen rate by timing study mostly just looking at kerns of grain yields and not measuring leaching in those that same experiment so we've actually have evidence that a fall nitrogen application um, does provide some benefits to kerns of grain yields. Uh, the next question is, are we seeing uh, any more losses or less losses if we're applying that nitrogen in the what fall? What was the difference between a fall treatment versus spring in yield? It's uh, statistically significant, um, but one could argue that probably not biologically relevant. And I'll make sure to have those data for the yeah. 
present in the Forever Green. Well, well that's, that'd be a question that I would, I don't know if we could even answer it, but you, pre you people probably know, do those kinds of roots stay alive and active and uh, working through the winter months here like in Minnesota or do they really go dormant? Well, I don't know if we don't totally know, uh, okay. but we do know that there is a lot of root biomass at the end of the growing season in the fall. We do a lot of root coring late October, early November before the winter. And yeah, we're pulling out live roots. So they're alive until the ground freezes for sure. Well, I thought that we had done the, uh, the rate of root turnover. That that's, study hasn't been done. That is, that's ongoing. Yeah, that's actually ongoing. It's all right. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if the uh, deeper rooting systems are less vulnerable to frost Right. right. You, you have a lot of biomass that's probably below the frost zone. Well, what, what that's an interesting, that's a really interesting idea. I don't know if we, do we have, are we merciless enough to make someone go out and sample roots all winter? Carmen, Carmen brought it up. He, he'll do it. <laughs> well, let, let me, that's why let I supported me. him earlier so I could come back and make him do something <laughs> not. <laughs> 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 Let me say this then, in that kerns of field that we planted in 2018, I've got my fingers crossed that those roots won't get down into the um, tile system in that, in that field, which is down four feet. And that's gonna be down to where we probably get little to no frost. So uh, we might get an answer uh, one way or the other if those tiles get rooted up. Hey, Carmen, has anybody, um stuck any instruments at the end of the, the tile line to see how much water's flowing out and how much nitrogen's flowing out of that field? No, and I've got a flow control on there if anybody ever wants to do that. <laughs> that sounds fun. I think we should it do does. It. Yeah, absolutely. I'd be wide open to that. Uh, and I've been trying to keep the water level about two feet from the surface as long as possible, but it's way down now. But there is a place where we could tap into that water right now. I could bring out some uh, some glass bottles, Carmen, that you could. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was just gonna offer, yeah, we could, well, there, if Don offered, we could definitely, yeah, we could think about how I. Uh, ser you know. Seriously, if you get me the bottles or anything and, and give me a protocol, I will do it uh, whenever possible. You knew there was gonna be a trade-off between uh, that and that, uh, the, that oven. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it never <laughs> stops. <laughs> Too much inside information here. <laughs> right. <laughs> oh yeah, that's good. Uh, yeah, let's let's keep talking offline about that. And then a quick Jessica, tell me where to send the soil samples. Oh yeah, yeah. Just email um, me. Well, if Don <laughs> is bringing you bottles, you could just make Don bring them into me. <laughs> well, before this gets too far off the rails, uh, yeah. <laughs> do we? Does anyone have any additional uh, questions for for David? Any comments for David before we sign off today? But again, uh, if you guys have, any, as we all know, these are lab meetings, and if you have any comments for any of the speakers or for anyone else that's been online, feel free to to send uh, your comments and updates of what you're doing and ideas that you have to, to uh, individuals or to the group. It would all be very much uh, appreciated. We're kind of all in this together, all learning together around these new, these new uh, crops and cropping systems. So all input uh, is, uh, is obviously welcome. So. Glad you